Last Lord's Day, we looked at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, where he rode in, a, in, he rode in as a humble yet completely victorious king on a, on a donkey. We, we spent a lot of time looking at how Jesus was showing himself to be king of kings and lord of lords. His donkey ride of dominion was a demonstration and fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about the sovereignty and the kingship of the Messiah. In the Palm Sunday story, the crowd welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem with palm branches and shouts of Hosanna. They recognized Jesus as their Savior, and they recognized Jesus as their King, and they respond with celebratory joy and praise. He's not just the king of individual hearts, but also the king of the world. He's not just my personal king, he's the king of all nations. The kingship of Jesus was not just personal, it was political. He, did, he didn't just save us from our iniquities, but also from our enemies. He came to reverse the curse he, in the earth. He came to not just to save, but to conquer, to conquer. His enemies were about to be made his footstool. In time and in history, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. According to Psalm 2, during Passion Week, the nations were raging and the people were plotting in vain. The kings and the rulers were conspiring together against Yahweh and his anointed. But God was laughing in mockery at their puny plans and their short-lived celebration on Good Friday. As I said last Sunday, Good Friday is the ultimate proof and the greatest example of all time of how history is a series of God's triumphs disguised as disasters. What they, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. The moment Satan thought he won is when he lost. The moment he bruised the heel of Jesus was when he was forever crushed and conquered. Again, I think that Christians are wrong when they radically personalize or when we radically personalize and individualize the gospel in such a way as to make it all about me and Jesus and just getting to heaven. Jesus is not merely king of your heart. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's more than your personal savior who's waiting for you to invite him into your heart. But I think you can roll off the roof on one side or the other. And that's what we talked about last week. It's possible that we are falling, we're failing to see the individual responsibility of submitting to the kingship of Christ because we're too busy criticizing other Christians for failing to see the kingship of Christ over all things. And the question I asked was, was this, as we proclaim the non-truncated gospel of the kingship of Christ over all the nations, are we actually saying not out loud, but with our attitude and our behavior, are we actually saying he's king of thee, but not king of me? He's king of thee, but not king of me. We would never say that, but sometimes our actions are so loud that people can't hear what we are proclaiming. It's so easy to criticize and critique what we see out there while ignoring what's going on in our own hearts and minds. We can easily proclaim that he's Lord of all, but can we honestly, can we honestly say, he, can we say, I surrender all? It's easy, to, it's easy to be so focused on the kingship of Christ over more than just the heart that we don't even notice that we are failing to surrender our own hearts. So I want to return to our Palm Sunday passage and point out something that we didn't talk about last week. Uh, there are some stones mentioned that we just passed by, or I should say skipped, we skipped the, that part. We're talking about the stones of Easter. I'm going to read the passage from Luke's account, and I want you to look for the stones. Luke 19, starting in verse 28. And when he, said these, when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to them, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now pay attention to what he says in the next verse. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The very stones would cry out. The Pharisees rebuked Jesus, told him to rebuke his disciples. They wanted Jesus to stop uh, stop them from saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. But Jesus responds by saying, I tell you, if they were silent, if they stopped singing that, the very stones would cry out. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? I want to, I uh, think this is important because this is something that's even, I mean, it's kind of new to me as I looked into this. Does Jesus mean that if the crowd stopped praising him, then the literal rocks would literally grow mouths and arms and start picking and playing their little rock guitars? Because, of course, they'd be rock guitars. Was he saying that if they stopped, a Christian version of the Rolling Stones would take over? Was he saying that if they would remain silent, the rest would be uh, an actual you know, rock concert? Okay, enough. Stop it. I, I think most of us have always thought that Jesus was just saying that if the crowd stopped praising him, he could cause anything or anyone including stones, to take over the job, to do it. But Jesus was not just riding in as king, victorious. He was also riding in with judgment. He was also bringing judgment to Jerusalem. What we really see happening in this text is an amazing contrast between the commendation of Jesus by the people and the condemnation of the people by Jesus. Let's stop and pause and remember the original point on God making a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham. He took Abraham, initiated a covenant, and then Abraham would have Isaac, and Isaac would have Jacob. Jacob would have his 12 sons who would become the 12 tribe, tribes of Israel, the people of God, God's chosen people. But when God called Abram and made a covenant with him way back in Genesis 12, he said, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, Abram, all the families of the earth, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Then in chapter 17, God confirmed his covenant with Abram and changed his name to Abraham. Genesis 17, verse 5. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Now, in the Hebrew, that Abram is kind of like, Abram means daddy, and, and Abraham means big daddy, you can say. Father of many. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you, and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. We see in Galatians 3, uh, this, this, this promise gets kicked up a notch, uh, that the offspring 
the offspring he kept mentioned, and your offspring after you, that offspring or seed promised to Abraham was Jesus. It was Christ himself. Galatians 3.16 says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not, Paul says, it does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So this promise to Abraham long ago was made to him and to his offspring. Not plural, not many, but Christ. It was a promise of Jesus coming. And Jesus would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. God told Abraham that in him all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He was specifically speaking about Christ. And the land promised to Abraham was not just Canaan. It wasn't just the promised land. In the New Testament, we also find out that Abraham was actually promised more than just that land. Paul in Romans 4, 13 said, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world. He'd be heir of the world. So the promise made to Abraham was about Christ, and it was that Christ would be the heir of the world. Jesus was the specific offspring to Abraham, and the promise was that he was the heir, not only of a land, but of the whole world. All the nations would be given to him. God's plan all along was to reverse the curse that began with Adam and eventually restore all creation through Jesus, the second Adam, in a new creation, a renewed creation. Jesus came to do what Israel had failed to do. Israel was supposed to be a, a mediator kind of nation, a nation that was supposed to be a blessing to all the other nations, and that didn't happen. John 1, 11 through 13 says, Of Jesus, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It was God's will. For the most part, Israel did not receive him. He was their long-awaited Messiah and rejected him. They rejected him. So when he rode into Jerusalem as king, he was also coming in judgment against Jerusalem. In fact, uh, the, the, the palm trees, I think, is pointing to this as well. The palm branches and the leaves that were on the ground. He's riding above the trees, right? He's riding above, and he's going into Jerusalem like as if he was coming in on the clouds of judgment, coming into the city in judgment against Jerusalem. He entered the conquered city in triumph, as I said last week, before it was conquered. Normally, you would have the war and then the victory procession. Jesus, being the model of all faith, switched that up. He held a triumphant procession before the battle. Jesus was triumphant before the triumph, and he displayed his triumph through a victory procession into Jerusalem. He was not only showing that he was king, but also that he was coming soon to judge. He was coming soon to judge Jerusalem. both the city and the temple. This becomes clear when we read on in Luke 19. If we keep reading on in the text, it says right after Jesus says in verse 40, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Listen to what he says next. Luke 19, verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. He saw the city that was rejecting him, that he knew was going to crucify him, and he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you. He's speaking to the city. He's weeping over the city, and he says, The days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. 
There's the stone again. They will not leave one stone upon another in the city. The crowds may have been cheering on, cheering on that dominion donkey ride, but Jesus was weeping. He knew that he would soon be coming back to this same city through their enemies in judgment and destruction. And, and again, notice in verse 44, they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is about to be destroyed in about 40 years of this, this ride into Jerusalem. 40 years from when Jesus is saying this. The very stones will cry out when Jerusalem and the temple will be barricaded, destroyed, and torn down. So that not one stone upon another would be left. In 70 AD, just 40 years later, this actually did happen. This actually happened. Rome barricades Jerusalem and then tears the city and the temple to the ground. He says, I tell you, if these were silent, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. After the triumphal entry, they were indeed silent. It goes from donkey to crickets, quiet, very quickly. Toward the end of Passion Week, on Good Friday, the silence is broken, but the crowds are now shouting something very different. We see this, being, we see this silence being broken later in Luke 23, verse 18, it says, but they all cried out together, away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city, and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should, he should be crucified, and their, voice, their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. But before they changed their tune, the crowds did go silent, and the stones would eventually cry out in judgment. And Jesus says the stones would cry out. When he says the stones would cry out, he's not saying they would sing praises. Uh, but crying out in agony in, in, or screaming. Uh, they would scream is one of the ways you can translate that. When the citizens of Jerusalem go silent, the stones of Jerusalem will cry out. We, we see this same kind of language in, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament little book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk? Habakkuk. Yeah, that sounds better. Uh, in a little prophecy in Habakkuk. Now I'm second-guessing how I'm going to say that. Tomato, tomato. In Hab, chapter 2, uh, we have a very good parallel. In the prophecy, we have a statement of judgment on the pagan, wicked Chaldeans, right? The Chaldeans uh, had basically prospered as a society, but they had prospered at the expense of other nations. They had prospered by extortion and usury uh, and, and murder and bloodshed. They had literally built their own towns and cities by the sacrifice and the slaughter and the abuse of other people. So Habakkuk, the prophet, is giving, given a message from God of judgment against the Chaldeans. Now listen, here's how it goes. Verse 6, shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, woe to him who heaps up what is not his own for how long and loads him with pledges? Woe to him is a curse. He's saying a curse on, on the Chaldeans. Will not your debtors suddenly rise? And those awake who will make you tremble, then you will be spoiled for them. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of, of man and the violence, of, uh, violence to the earth, to the cities, and to all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. Now listen to this. 
for the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. And I love this next verse. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Again, verse 12 says, Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. The stones in the houses and buildings that they built were symbols of this wickedness from which they built it. The walls of their houses and the timbers of their roofs plundered from others, gained by bloodshed and usury, scream of their wickedness, scream of their guilt. And in verse 11 he says, For the stone will cry out from the wall. The stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. This is the terminology of judgment. Stones crying out means judgment and destruction. This is the same thing that Jesus is saying in our text. The stones would cry out against you as the stones in the past cry out against the guilt of the Chaldeans. Again, in our text it says in verse 43, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. This is exactly what happened at 70 AD when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem and destroyed it. You can read a lot of details about that through in Josephus on the Jewish wars. Before uh, Jesus already had predicted this uh, several times, I want to read Matthew's account of it. Matthew 23 says this, O Jerusalem, this is Jesus talking again, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you were not willing See, your house is left to you desolate. For I will tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if we ignore the chapter divisions, you know, those weren't there in the original text. Those are put there uh, later. But if we ignore the, the chapter divisions, we can understand now what is being said in Matthew 24, the next chapter, the next verse. In uh, Matthew 24, verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was going away. He just said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, how I would have gathered you in. Now he's leaving the temple, he's going away, and it says, and when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, this is their, their pride, the, the great temple, and they're pointing it out to him. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? talking about the temple. Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. This temple, this house of God is going to be torn down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I don't believe he's talking here about the end of the, the world. Uh, but the end of the Old Testament age. He's talking about the end of the temple, the end of the Judaic system. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. It was done. It was done. And he was talking about the destruction at 70 AD that was coming. He was talking about a time in the near future when there would not be left here at the temple in Jerusalem one stone upon another that would not be thrown down. And that's exactly what happens. Then he uses all kinds of language that we think is about the end of time, but it's it's same language used all throughout the Old Testament to predict destruction of cities and nations. All right, back to our text in Luke 19. Notice what happened next, verse 45. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. 
So what, this is all happening in a sequence of, of events for a reason. When he cleans the temple out, that means something. This is a, a, the second time he cleaned the temple. So he, he, remember, he made the whips and he drove the money changers out and he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. See, Israel had made it exclusively about them. The Gentiles were kept out of the courtyard even, and they were selling to the Israelites, and, and he get, gets angry and makes a whip and drives them out. But this is the second time he cleaned the temple. This all goes back to Leviticus, the Old Testament law in, verse, in chapter 14. The law, did you know there's laws for cleansing houses that have leprosy in the Old Testament? There's, the, the, uh, there's, a, a, there's laws on what to do if your house is moldy, if your house has leprosy, they called it. A leprous house laws. The Levites had to inspect, if you had mold or this, this leprosy in your house, you were to get the Levites to come inspect the house, right? They would come in and check out the house, and if they found, I don't know, remember all the details, but if they found some stones, they would take those stones out and put new stones in, and they would cleanse everything. And then if, they, if it was moldy again, they would come in, clean it again for the second time, just like Jesus came into the temple two times. And then it says in the law, if it's moldy again, if it happens a third time, the, the Levites were to destroy the whole house. Every stone of the house was to be destroyed and th taken outside the camp of Israel. I believe that's what's happening here. He's cleaning the temple a second time because the house is leprous, the house of God, and he's about to destroy the temple. In the next chapter of our text, Luke 20, Jesus tells a parable that also talks about a stone. Luke 20, verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And, uh, and he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. This is a picture of how God would send Israel, called in the Old Testament a vineyard of God, over and over, send the prophets, and they would just uh, cast them out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. This is why Jesus wept when he rode into Jerusalem. He knew that many in that city and the city itself would be crushed soon in judgment. Israel had been waiting for the Messiah for so long. They've been singing the messianic psalms from childhood about the, the Messiah. They had hoped for he would be there soon. And he had finally arrived. He was God incarnate, dwelling or tabernacling among them, and they were about to kill him. This is what it says in the opening of John. I read a couple of verses. Here's the, the, the context. Verse 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. This is speaking of Jesus. He's the word who was with God and was God. He's the, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light. John was not the light. 
um, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, Jesus, the, the word made flesh, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This is what I read earlier. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the same word for tabernacle. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now fast forward, Passion Week, Holy Week. After Jesus was crucified and on the cross, there's another stone mentioned that covered a stone tomb. The chief cornerstone was buried in a stone tomb. But what everyone should have expected happened. The stone was rolled away, and Jesus was risen indeed. He conquered the grave, and the tomb was now empty. The stone was rolled open, and the chief cornerstone walked out victorious. John 20 says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. I always like the way that's written. John's writing this, and he says, So... Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that was him, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Not, he rose. No, he, they took, they've taken him somewhere. They've taken his corpse. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. It wasn't until now that they saw and believed. As yet, they did not understand the scripture. I brought this up at the sunrise service this morning for those of you who were there and are really holy. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but it just always amazes me uh, that none of them expected him to rise from the dead. He was with them all this time. He was with them. He told them it was going to happen. They were all just hiding. They were fearful. They were sad. Nobody paid attention to what Jesus had told them. He told them he would be killed and rise on the third day. I read this this morning, Mark 9. It says, they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered up into the hands of men, and they will kill him. Notice he said that. He said, the Son of Man, him, is going to be delivered up into the hands of men, and they will kill him. But he didn't stop there. He said, and when he's killed, after three days, he will rise. And I love this next verse but they did not understand the saying. Okay, they're going to kill me, and in three days I'm going to rise. Hmm, they didn't understand what he was saying. And were afraid to ask him. That's just, that's comedy right there. But it's not funny, because they didn't believe. His people did not receive him, and his disciples did not believe him. As Alistair Begg, I quoted uh, for the exhortation today, I just want to read one part of that again. He says, the Bible does not attempt to deny or idealize the grief felt by Christ's followers after his crucifixion. They didn't understand what had happened, and they certainly didn't know 
What would happen next? Their sadness reveals humanity's limitations in knowing the bigger picture. How often do we just experience this? We don't see the bigger picture. In other words, that God is sovereign and in control of all things. All things are working together for the good of those who are called according to his purposes. He says, despite the Old Testament prophecies and Jesus' own foretelling of his death, John's gospel tells us that as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. They didn't understand that when Jesus said from the cross, it is finished, he was not expressing defeat, but declaring victory. But before we're too harsh on them, uh, let's, let's close by just taking a quick peek into the mirror. Okay, go. No, I'm just kidding. We, we're the same way. We, we have all the promises of God. We got, we got the Word of God. We got Scripture with full of promises, full of uh, stuff that we should be grounded in, stand on, firm in, have faith. We, too, forget the bigger picture. We, too, take our eyes off of Christ. We, too, forget that He brings life out of death. We forget that he brings victory out of defeat. So we need to remind ourselves, just as much as they needed to be reminded, that our God reigns and Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our gracious God and Father, everything that we have comes from you. You fill us with good things. Our hearts and lives overflow with your abundance. With thanksgiving and gratitude, we bring to you our time, talents, and tithes. Use these gifts that you have given us to feed others as we have been fed, to serve others as we have been served, and to bless others as we have been blessed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.